Welcome to God's Truth. I'm Dr. D. Todd Harrison as we continue to flood the world with God's truth. Today we're looking at 1st and 2nd Thessalonians as we continue to teach the New Testament in the year 2023. Uh, next year we'll be moving to the Book of Mormon, another testament of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And of that same Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I testify as one of his witnesses that he lives today. He is our Lord, our God, our Savior, Redeemer. He conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he sits enthroned at the right hand of our Heavenly Father in glory and splendor. Let's see what we can learn today from the Apostle Paul in talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's look at uh, first, the first Thessalonians, and we'll begin with um, begin with the um, chapter one, chapter one of uh, First Thessalonians. It says Paul and Silvanus, so Silas and Timotheus. This is Timothy. That these are their Greek names. Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then include uh, both uh, the Greek and the Hebrew greetings of grace be unto you and peace, shalom, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Remember Pauline theology, as you uh, uh, come unto God and unto Jesus Christ, you become the adopted sons and daughters of God. Therefore, you're the elect of God, as, as you're uh, seen by God as sons and daughters compared to any other uh, people on the earth. For our gospel, now that's because, remember before, it's my gospel, but now as he's got Silas and Timothy helping him, our gospel. So this is the gospel of Timothy, Silas, and, uh, and, uh, and Timothy, not the one being preached by the Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency. We've looked at that in all the lessons so far uh, this year in, in the when we started with Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Colossians, Philippians, and so forth. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Remember, that's his attack here against James, right? The, James writes these letters and sends out these letters of recommendation indicating who's the true apostles, who's the true uh, uh, servants of God, and Paul doesn't have one of these. And uh, so he's using this as another opportunity, saying it didn't just come in word only as the 12 now, or sitting in Jerusalem, living off of the people. He's going to come back and say that later on, that they're working. He and, uh, and Silas and Timothy are working with their own hands to support themselves while they preach the gospel. They're not living off of the tithing and the fast offerings of the people sitting around comfortably in Jerusalem, just sending out letters. They're going to all these cities uh, throughout the then known world, they're being persecuted, being stoned and, and spit upon and hit and so forth. He says, so it didn't come just our gospel, didn't come in word only. Our gospel being that, uh, again, is defined as no need to keep the law of Moses, right? No need to keep the law, the law of Moses. Uh, there's a need to keep the Ten Commandments, no, but not the law of Moses. Twelve going around preaching, keep the law of Moses, even though Christ came. Okay, he says, uh, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, right? Remember, he attacked. Uh, James and 2 Corinthians say that said that the, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, right? So he's saying that my preaching is not just in, in word only, it's not just by letter only. I preach to you directly, I preach to you directly. As I preach to you, the Holy Ghost gave life to my words, so you know that they were the words of God. And in much assurance, and as you know what manner of man we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything, just because of your examples were so good that the word of the gospel was able to spread throughout. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you, the Thessalonian saints, turned to God from worshiping 
false idols and images to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. So again, God and Jesus, two separate persons, God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. God, separate individual, raised Jesus from the dead. Pay attention, Protestants and evangelicals and believers in false Trinitarian uh, 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 articles of faith, if you will. Okay, so that is powerful here at the end of chapter 1. Move to chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. For yourselves, brother, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And not just at Philippi, but wherever they were being persecuted, they continued forward and continued to preach the word of God boldly and with assurance and, and with faith. For exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing man, but God, which trieth our hearts. Well, no, you know, when you're out uh, telling people, you know, that you wish that the, uh, the president of the church, the, his counselors in the 12 would just cut off the rest of their private parts. <laughs> you know, they, certainly he's not out there, uh, uh, you know, the pleasing man, right? He's just trying to please God. And in verse five here, for neither any time use we flattering words. Yeah, definitely not flattering words to tell them to go cut off their private parts, right? As ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of man sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. So he's leading up here to that there, those 12 in the in, in Jerusalem, they are burdensome to you. They're requiring you to send them money, uh, you know, a tithing and fast offerings and the, whatever other contributions they may have had at that time. But we're not burdensome to you. We work with our own hands so that you don't have to give us money. You don't have to pay us, Timothy, Silas, and, and Paul. You don't have to pay us any money, right? Uh, 7 through 8. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her, her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. That's a great thing for a great scripture for missionaries or all the missionaries throughout the world, right? You know, not only are you willing to impart, you need to ask yourself, not only willing to impart uh, the gospel of God, but are you able to impart, you know, would you say you'd be willing to impart your own souls for the people, just like Paul, if you love the people and they feel that uh, love from you, uh, you'd be even greater missionaries than you are now. Let's look at 9 through 11. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day. We were working night and day making tents. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ten, ye are witnesses in God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Another way to preach the gospel is your father, you know, taught you, so you teach the people the gospel. Twelve, that you would walk worthy of God. Ooh, ooh, Protestants, evangelical alert. Here he says it again, right? Totally contrary to your false doctrine, doesn't he? Your own guy, Paul again. Saying that you need to walk worthy of God. He didn't say you just have to believe in Jesus and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Nor did he say that. The whole thing has always been about living a holy life, living a righteous life, keeping the commandments. He's going to. He's not done after this. He's going to show us. Uh, he's going to write more about this coming up here in, this, in these letters here today. So that you walk worthy of God, who has called you into His kingdom. And glory, it does matter how you live your life. It, doesn't, it does not matter if you only accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The devil and his demons from hell accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. That doesn't save them either. 
19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So that's Paul's version of a similar type of scripture that you get in the Doctrine and Covenants. We're talking about even if you labor all your days and you bring just one soul unto God, how great shall be your joy with that, you know, with that soul uh, together in, in the kingdom of heaven, right? So that's what Paul's saying, you know, that our joy, our glory is going to be, our rejoice is going to be when we're when you're with us in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Uh-oh, evangelicals. You need to, another commandment, right? That's the second commandment of the law. They came up to Jesus and said, Master, tell us what's the two great commandments of, of the law, right? Well, you should love. So something you have to do, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to be safe. Wouldn't that be great if you guys, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, I, I certainly, uh, uh, I can see what, what you're hoping for that, that you can be saved without doing anything. Be nice to just sit around, just say you believe in Jesus and just do whatever you want. But the problem is, that's totally contrary to the biblical doctrine all the way through the Bible. You have to love. Right? That's what the Jesus said. You have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. That takes effort on your part. On your part, right? You not only saved only by grace only. Jesus said you had to do an action. He said you had to love God. Then he said the second great commandment is like unto the first one, that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. Again, that's action. That's effort on your part that you have to love. You have to keep commandments. Love, in this case, love God and love your neighbor. And you have to go out and do it, right? You have to do it. Totally contrary to your false doctrine. Your own guy, Paul, again, shooting down your doctrine, proving that Protestantism and, uh, and evangelicalism are not biblical-based religions. Very clear on that. And we're being very generous and even, you know, in stating that, right? Because, you know, no question about it. Your doctrine is totally contrary to everything Paul has said. We've looked at this from Romans. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, we looked at Ephesians, we looked at Philippians, Colossians, and now in First Thessalonians, he's doing it again, isn't he? He's shooting you guys down. He's proving that your the doctrine is not biblical based. It's not biblical based. It's built upon the philosophy of men, not even mingled with Scripture, right? Because <laughs> Scripture is contrary to everything you teach and believe. Okay, let's continue on here. 19, and that was in, um, so chapter 3, 12 through 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end he may establish your hearts. See, he can't even establish your hearts. Unblameable, you know, if you only believe, if you only accept Jesus as your Savior, he cannot do it. Here he says, to the end he may establish your hearts un blamable and holiness before God. How can he do it? Only by you loving one another. That's what he just said. Totally contrary to your false doctrine. Totally contrary. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblamable in holiness only because of this love you have one for another. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Okay, moving to chapter 4. We'll look at 1 through 10. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and please God. How do you please God? By accepting the Lord as your Savior? No, no. And he's going to make it more clear in the next couple of verses. How do you please God? Well, let's watch this. That ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so that you would abound more and more, right? He could only bless you more and more if you keep his Ten Commandments. For you know what commandments, even he said the word, you have to keep the commandments. It's not just enough to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Nowhere does it say that. Nowhere does your Paul say that. We've looked at all his references. We've looked at everything Paul has said so far. We've looked at it. Start watching our videos from Romans, 1st 
2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and now in Thessalonians. And you'll see it's totally contrary to what your pastor and preacher have told you. They've lied to you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, where they've been lied to and they just passed on the lies to you. You have been lied to. Your souls are in jeopardy unless you reject the false traditions of your preachers and to come into the biblical doctrine and believe in the biblical Jesus Christ. That's how you can become saved. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You can only become sanctified by keeping the commandments, not by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Nowhere does it say you'll become sanctified by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It says you will become sanctified by keeping the commandments. He makes it more even clear here that you should abstain from fornication. Commandment, right? That every one of you should know how to possess his body, his vessel, his body in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother. Right? Doesn't matter if they accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. If they defraud their brother, they don't repent of their sins, they're in trouble. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't matter if they accepted Jesus as their Savior. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. Forewarned you. Who? Who? The Thessalonian saints. Those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He's warned them about it. Wake up, evangelicals. Wake up, Protestants, to what the Bible is actually saying. Let's say, let's read the Bible for once. Let's pay attention to what the Bible says. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Doesn't matter if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's called you to become a holy, commandment-keeping, covenant people. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, but you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Right? That's what Jesus said. That's what the, the law of Moses said. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. We beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. You even need to love more and more. You love the brethren in Macedonia. You need to learn to love even more and more. Not, not accept Jesus more and more. <laughs> You got to do this action. You got to do the commandments. You got to keep the commandments. You don't have to keep the law of Moses. When he says you don't, you're not saved by the law, he's talking about the law of Moses. We've looked at that several times. The people in those days thought they had to be saved by keeping the law of Moses. That's not true. But you do have to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. Thirteen through eighteen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Here's the rapture, right? We're getting the rapture. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So all the dead that you see in these gra gravestones and, and tombstones, they will rise with Jesus when Jesus comes back. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep, right? It's going to prioritize both of us. Right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, when Christ comes back, and that are reading this when he comes back, right? And remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, those of you who have been with us all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament know exactly what we're talking about when we talk about these clouds, right? These are not the clouds you look out your window and see. We're not going to go meet Jesus floating on some 
you know, the white, the, you know, some white cloud like that, right? We've talked about this several times before. You know, this is physical objects that are flying around. That Jesus is coming back. We know from the book of Psalms that he has over 20,000 of these. And that was, you know, what, 3,000 years ago. So who knows how many they got now? Uh, you know, we, anyways, we got it tons and tons and tons when you looked at all those references all the way through. So that's what we're talking about here again, the, the clouds, right? The, not the actual clouds outside. These are people who don't know how to describe unidentified flying objects. So they call them clouds, but there's some sort of flying object uh, that they're able to transport and from which they're going to be shooting and raining down fire and hell and brimstone to destroy all the wicked, which we've seen in many, many scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we'll get more of that when we get to the book of Revelation. Okay, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Moving to chapter 5, 1 through 6. But of the times and the seasons of when Christ is coming back, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Nobody knows. Even Jesus said he didn't know the day. He said only the Father knows. But it may be that even the Father doesn't know. He's waiting for the circumstances to be right upon the earth. He knows what he's looking for. He knows the right circumstances in which he's looking for to come down. And not that he has some set date and counting down, marking off on his calendar when that, you know, when that exact day in the moment would be so they we know the angels don't know jesus doesn't know and it's uh, questionable whether whether even god knows right for uh it says but it'll be as though a thief in the night right for and they shall say peace and safety say oh it's okay we don't need to worry jesus is not coming it's been two thousand plus years uh he hasn't come there's no jesus that's going to be coming then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. I always be doing your best to live a Christian life and, and watching for the Lord to come, and you'll be ready when he comes. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who don't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ or be appointed unto wrath, as many scriptures teach. Uh, in 10, who died for us, Jesus Christ died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, it doesn't matter whether we're dead when he comes or whether we're alive when he comes. We should live together with him forever and ever. And 14 through 28. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, because even if they accepted Jesus, it <laughs> doesn't matter, right? If they're unruly, they will not be saved in the kingdom of heaven. So warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow them that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you and will also do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so ends the first Thessalonians. And abstain from all appearance of evil in verse 22. Again, doesn't matter whether you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are to abstain from evil that's the true biblical doctrine your churches that teach otherwise than that you need to leave them forsake them and get to the biblical christian true church okay we move now to second thessalonians you can take a quick water break here
Okay, so 2 Thessalonians, and we'll begin in uh, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, so Silas, Timothy, Paul, unto the church of the Thessalonians, and God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because of your faith growth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward one another aboundeth. Charity, love, right? They love each other, and they continue to grow it, right? So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token. Watch this. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. So what he's saying here is that all men have fallen short of the glory of God and deserve punishment, great punishment, right? God allows his Christian saints to suffer a little bit persecution just as a token of the punishment that should have been theirs had it not been for Jesus Christ stepping into their place and dying for them in their sins upon the cross. So it's a token of the righteous judgment of God. And by pouring out his judgment upon you here, you know, on earth, then you'll be worthy to enter the kingdom of, of heaven. And that's why you suffer. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. But don't worry, those who trouble you are going to get tribulation directly from God. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Because they're going to be flying in these clouds that they don't know how to describe, right? We've looked at hundreds of these references in the Bible, right? They're coming on these flying objects. They're going to be shooting fire and bombs and missiles and so forth down on the wicked to destroy them. So they come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting, right? Protestants, evangelicals, uh, the Lord again here, <laughs> wake up, look what your guy Paul is saying, right? He's, boy, it's just got to be tough to be a Protestant or evangelical in today's world. If you actually read the Bible, how can anyone possibly still be a Protestant or evangelical? The whole Bible is totally contrary to your doctrine. He says here he's going to be what? They're going to be taking, shooting in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doesn't say on those who don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doesn't say, uh, you know, that they're, you know, on those who, who accept Jesus as their Savior. No, again, who's he writing to? The Thessalonian saints, those who have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. He's warning those who have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior that if they don't obey and keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, the angels and God, Jesus and the angels coming back on clouds to shoot fire and vengeance upon you. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord? Doesn't matter whether they accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, even the devil does. And from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because their testimony among you was believed in that day. He knows he's having a hard time getting the people to believe at this time because he's got Peter, he's got James, Peter, and John, and the Quorum of Twelve going around saying that Paul's lying to him and Paul's teaching a false gospel, right? And uh, so he's having a hard time getting people to believe him, but he knows that in the last days, God's already told him his testimony, his gospel is going to win out, that you don't have to keep the law of Moses. You got to keep the Ten Commandments. You don't have to keep the law of Moses. That will win out. And so in the last days, the people will believe his gospel. And so he, so here's the, that's what he's uh, saying here, because our testimony, whose testimony? Paul, Silas, and Timothy's testimony among you will be believed in that day when Jesus Christ comes. And today we we accept Pauline doctrine, you know, as, as the word of God. We, we're not preaching, keep the ten, the, we're, we're preaching what he taught to keep the 10 commandments. That is not needful to keep the 613 commandments of the law of Moses. We don't have to worry about how we wash our hands. We don't need to worry about having debates, whether or not it's appropriate or whether it's against the commandments to defecate on the Sabbath day, for example. 
Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 2, 1 through 14. Now we beseech you, brethren. Here we go. Here's a big one coming up. By, uh, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, uh, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, <laughs> James, James' famous letters, as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be worried about this, anyone saying right now, in 60, 50, 60 AD, that the, that the day of the Lord, that the day of Christ is soon at hand. It's not. The, the important events have to take place before then. So don't be troubled by any words or any letters, you know, saying that the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the second coming of Jesus Christ, shall not come except there be a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the day uh, of Jesus Christ's second coming will not take place until there's an apostasy from the Christian church. He knows that the people are going to create Protestantism, create evangelicalism, create the Catholic church, create all these things that are not true forms of Christianity. He knew that. He testified to the saints of Thessalonica that that would take place, that these false forms of Christianity would arise, that the true uh, Christian church would go out into the wilderness, as we'll get to in the book of Revelation, for nearly 2,000 years before it would be restored by God in its fullness of its authority and power to begin to be preached and taught and uh, eligible for people to be able to become members of it. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come to be coming away, a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So uh, he's talking about the Antichrist here. Uh, um, some have taken this to be the Pope. Uh, but that would be kind of, and we have dual uh, fulfillment of prophecies oftentimes where some prophecies will, you know, we see this in Isaiah, for example, where he's talking about the fall of Lucifer being cast out with his one third of the angels of heaven, cast out of heaven, uh, but then also comparing King Nebuchadnezzar to that. Uh, so you often get these kinds of things here in scripture. So on the one hand, it may be the Pope, but it, as we look at here, uh, and, uh, as we continue to look at these other verses and not take it just directly uh, now, and, you know, it should be taken a little bit out of context here. We're looking at the uh, false prophet of the book of Revelation. So, uh, uh, so who, uh, so this this um, uh, this antichrist uh, will um, uh, oppose and exalt himself above all that's called God. Right? He's going to command all to worship him. Uh, he's going to win some great uh, battle, which uh, uh, from some sort of looks like it's some sort of alien invasion. Uh, we'll get to all this in the book of Revelation, but it can be some sort of like alien invasion, whether they're actual aliens, whether they're demons posing as aliens. We, we just don't have these answers yet. But it seems to be there's going to be this attack from, from space. Uh, the uh, false prophet is going to be able to defeat them and then exalt himself and claim that he's, you know, he's more powerful than God. He's going to uh, take over the Jerusalem temple that will be built at that time. Uh, he'll go sit in there as though he's uh, God sitting in his uh, temple. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem temple yet to be built, showing himself that he is God and commanding all to worship him as God, for he's so great and powerful and did all these miracles. He'll be doing all kinds of miracles and healings and raising the dead and all these sort of things, you know, and defeating some sort of attacking uh, um, a force uh, from outer space. He says here, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. I already told you guys 
when I was with you personally. Now I'm writing just to remind you of what I'd already taught you. And now you know what withhold it that he might be revealed in his time. So, so it says that, you know, he's being withheld until he's revealed in that time of when just shortly before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So again, we know obviously that's not directly the Pope. The Pope may have fulfilled some of this, you know, because they, a lot of Protestants have tried to show how well, you know, he, they, they sit behind this, uh, you know, they sit in this booth and they have the people confess sins to him and they decide whether to forgive him or not. And so in a sense, they're acting as though they're God, stuff like that. So in one sense, it may be uh, somewhat applicable there, but clearly this is talking about the, uh, uh, the Antichrist uh, and the uh, false prophet uh, in the time of Jesus Christ uh, coming back. And, and now he's being so now and and now you know what with holy that he might be revealed in his time so he would not be revealed until the second coming of jesus christ we've had what a hundred plus or so uh popes uh, you know over the last two thousand years for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and then shall the wicked one be revealed so at that time again when the time of second coming that wicked one, the false prophet, shall be revealed, the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with his brightness at his coming. We'll read more about that when we get to the book of Revelation. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, Satan's going to give him power to do all kinds of miracles, with all power and signs and lying wonders. We're going to, again, the book of Revelation talks about you know all these sort of things. He's going to do all kinds of miracles, right? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They could have accepted the true gospel of Jesus Christ as it was preached to them. The church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They rejected it, right? Therefore, because they rejected in verse 11, and for this cause, the rejection, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So they go from from rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ being taught by the missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and instead now believe this great delusion, this great lying false prophet has been given power from Satan to do all kinds of miracles and work wonders, even maybe allowing his own his own alien space force to be destroyed, uh, you know, by the false prophet to show that the false prophet is so powerful and that he is God, right? Okay, so very interesting. He says here that they might all be damned to believe not the truth, but a pleasure and unrighteousness. Very clear. If you reject the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, you shall be damned. You cannot return to our Heavenly Father's presence. So in that sense, you'll be damned. Yes, you can receive, uh, ultimately receive a degree of glory from the lowest of the terrestrial kingdom, you know, on up through the terrestrial, but you will not return to the celestial kingdom of our Lord and God and with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ come visit those in the terrestrial kingdom from time to time. Those that end up in the terrestrial will receive the ministration of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so then he says here, 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and the belief of truth. Wherefore, whereunto he hath called you by our gospel, right? That being preached by Paul, Silas, and Timothy, not by James, Peter, and John. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, not the epistles of James. <laughs> and we're going to get to the epistle of James coming up in a few in a few weeks, right? That's going to be a very pro. Uh, keeping the Jewish law, keeping the law of Moses, uh, showing your faith by how well you keep the law of Moses, all these sort of things. We have that in the New Testament. We have the epistle of James where he's, he preaches that kind of stuff, right? So he's our epistle, right? <laughs> our epistle, the epistles of Paul, right? Okay, so then he says in 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, with us, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. 
<laughs> Every good word and work. Yeah, Protestants. Uh, you're talking again about having to do good works, doesn't he? Just over and over again, bashes down your false religion, proves your religion, your church is not built upon biblical doctrine. Of that, you need to repent. You need to reject the traditions. It's like he said here, the traditions. He even used the word, right? Brother Stenfast, an older tradition which you've been taught. You need to reject the false traditions you've been taught and hold to the traditions of the Bible. Those are the traditions you need to uh, uh, cling unto. Okay, chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. Oh, Protestants and evangelicals again. So, so it's got to be tough, right? It's got to be tough to be a... To, to be a member of a Christian sect who doesn't believe in the Bible, who does not teach the Bible, the biblical truth. And so if you find yourself in a case like this, where your preacher is not preaching biblical doctrine as taught in the Bible, you need to flee from that church and run away from it as fast as you can. You need to get out of there. They are leading your souls down to hell. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Commandments you have to keep based upon the Ten Commandments, not the 613 laws of Moses. Verse 5 through 18. And the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. So if you keep the commandments, what happens? The Lord will direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Great blessings, right? Now I command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after tradition which he has received of us. We've looked at this several times before. One of the main themes all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament is you need to keep company with the believers. You need to keep company with those who believe in the same Jesus Christ, as the Bible teaches, and, and holds to the same uh, values and, and moral standards that the, that the Bible teaches. I know every now and then there's somebody out there that says something different. I know that there's a, a senior leader of the church who has made some comments. It's certainly sounded uh, quite contrary to this, and he's made it not just once or twice by mistake, but has said it repeatedly for more than 20 years. It doesn't matter, right? I'm sure he has some good heart or what, what? I don't know what he's thinking, right? But clear word of the God as confirmed by the majority of the brethren, right? In fact, all, pretty much all of them, right? Except for him, right? All the way through all the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament prophets and the Apostle Paul is you stay away from those who are not keeping the commandments of God. Very simple. If, if you stay away from them, you don't have to worry about them leading you astray as well. Very simple, very simple biblical doctrine. Okay, and he says here, Withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which you received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we have behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor. He says it again, right? The attack against the 12 apostles, right? He says, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We worked day and night building tents so that uh, we could support ourselves and we, we would not need to ask you to send us tithing and fast offerings so we could live off of them comfortably in Jerusalem. Not because we have not power to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Woo, that's a tough commandment, isn't it? To those, those that are not willing to work, then Paul says, don't let him eat. Right? For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. They don't work, but they're busy buddies, right? Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. It's necessary we go out and get our own jobs and work to earn our own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. 
need to be doing well. It's just He says it over and over again. I don't know how there's ever been any confusion in the history of Christianity as to these basic principles of the gospel. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and what? Have no company with him that he may be ashamed, right? Said it again. It's the whole, the whole Bible is about it. The whole thing when they went into the land of, of Israel was to kill off all the people living in there because they're not keeping the commandments of God and they're going to lead you astray. And if you marry their, marry their daughters, and their sons, they're going to lead you astray to worship after their gods. The Israelites did not listen to this advice from God that was been taught by many prophets of the Old Testament. And what happened? Ultimately, they got destroyed by, by the judgments of God, didn't they? Because they were worshiping false gods. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So don't fellowship with him. Don't don't spend time with him. You can uh, uh, talk to talk to them. You know, kind of like a public uh, sermon or something to to admonish them as brothers. Now the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, another powerful lesson of the Apostle Paul. He taught a lot, a lot of very great biblical doctrine here and of his love and showed us love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the importance of keeping the commandments of Jesus Christ. Part of those commandments is to accept Jesus Christ, to accept Jesus Christ's church, which is representation of his kingdom of heaven. You cannot accept Jesus and reject his kingdom, right? The two go together. You accept Jesus, therefore you accept his kingdom. So for those of you who are not yet members of his church and kingdom upon the earth, we extend you a warm invitation directly from the Lord to reach out to the missionaries of his church. Let them know. We'll put in a, a link in the description of this video, a link. Just click on that link. Let the missionaries know you're ready to accept Jesus Christ, that you're ready to repent of your sins, that you want to follow him and keep his commandments. And they will help you to get on that road. And, and that leads back to your Heavenly Father's presence. You'll be able to be baptized by those who actually hold the priesthood and authority of God. You'll re actually receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, not just to fill him from time to time, but to actually be your constant companion in your walk and in leading you into the truth. Of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the principles that, that you need to be doing and, and, and acting upon. For those of you who fallen in activity in the church, we welcome you back to the church. Reach out to whoever you can. Reach out to your ministering, uh, uh, the people. Reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to, you know, your Relief Society president, your Elders Corn president, your bishop, missionaries, and just say, help me. Just grab them by the hand, help me. And they'll be glad to help you once again become a full member of the, the fellowship of the saints of God. Closing, I again bear my testimonies to the truthfulness of these things we've looked at today. These are true. Jesus Christ really does live. There really are some of us who really do know that. We, In closing, we further we extend to you the blessings of the Lord, that you may have food to eat, that you may have safe shelter overhead. For those of you who are sick or otherwise afflicted, that you will be healed in accordance with the will of God, in accordance to your faith. We bless you to have basic financial resources to carry out God's mission for you upon the earth, to become who you, he wants you to become, to work in the, to get the education he wants you to get, to get the, uh, the type of jobs that he'd have you get. We bless you with all these things. Until next time, we leave these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>